Buonasera, um, benvenuti. Um, stasera abbiamo Kento uh, Kiss um, um, a una conversazione su, um, il suo lavoro anche uh, su idee come essere africano. Uh, questa è una grande domanda, è quasi impossibile di rispondere, ma Kento ha la sua idea molto molto intelligente. Ok, I changed the English because tonight um, we have Kendall Gills, um, who is the African artist tonight, <laughs> to be with us, um, to talk about how to be an African. <laughs> um, um, uh, before we start, uh, I want to just uh, introduce that for those who have not yet seen the exhibitions of um, um, the so-called African art exhibitions, we have two exhibitions and for the summer. One is African Metropolis, uh, which is about a kind of imagined African city um, curated by Simon Jamie and um, uh, our curator Elena Motisi. Um, it's just right here up uh, in the uh, gallery, gallery three. And then in Gallery 5, we have another exhibition curated by Anne Palopoli um, with the work of Kendall Gills at the very entrance. We are very happy that actually this work is in the collection of the Maxi. Uh, in a, coming into the Maxi in a very interesting way, I guess. And, um, and um, uh, this exhibition is called Road to Justice. Um, so being an artist from South Africa, uh, I guess this is a essential question. What is justice, right? Um, I remember meeting Kendall the first time. Um, I guess it was 1995 uh, in Amsterdam. Um, one evening, I went to an opening at the, the Apple Art Center. Uh, before getting to the, um, the building, uh, we saw a broken window. So I asked my friends, what happens? How come an exhibition has a broken window in such an important museum? And then they said, this is Kendall Gives. So this is how I met Kendall. Um, so tonight we are very, very happy to have Kendall here because uh, we are very obsessed by this idea of what is an African. And it seems that uh, Kendall has some kind of interesting answer to that. Um, especially he, um, one day he decided to call himself Kendall Gears and born in 1968. And what's the connection between Kendall Gears 68 and Africa? Uh, thank you very much. Very kind words to start. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be part of the exhibition, which I think is absolutely wonderful. I'm very honored to show this work, um, which is from, I think it's from 94, so it predates the, the brick through the window. Um, so I guess before I can begin, we need to uh, kick the big white elephant out of the room because um, very frequently in any such discussion about Africa, um, the, one of the very first generalizations or cliches or questions will be, oh, but you're white and you come from South Africa, are you a real African? And so the answer to that question is I took the map over there of Africa, I cut South Africa out and I made it there into making these eyes um, in order to create a new map of Africa. So um, yeah, I was born in South Africa many years ago. Now we see the white elephant. And the white elephant that I want to speak about is to challenge perceptions of what Africa might be. Um, now we all know this very famous uh, elephant um, which is very close to where I'm staying in the marvelous hotel, um, the, the elephant of Bernini. But on the back of the elephant of Bernini is an obelisk which is coming from Egypt, one of Cleopatra's obelisks. Now, this is very much the history that I want to speak to and speak about. 
Africa was never discovered. It's not like the New World, it's not like the United States. Africa was always there. In the very earliest maps of the world from the European imagination, it was divided into Asia, Europe, and Africa. Africa has always been part of the European imagination. Now, even though a lot of Europeans might want to place Egypt in Europe, Egypt is actually part of Africa. So, Africa has this long and complex history. Um, and one of the things I want to speak today about is perception. I want to speak about how we construct the images of the world as we know it, and how those images bind us to certain kinds of prejudice. So for instance, why is the map of the world that way around? And I love this Alighiero Baretti reference. Um, he'll come back later. Um, and why not that way around? Well, the answer is very simple. Because the people who made the maps were European. So they put themselves on top. In a disk in space, there is no top or bottom. Why do you put Europe on top? Because you live in Europe. Why do you put Europe in the middle of the map? Because the cartographers were European. But before that habit, before that stereotype, before that prejudice fell into place, well, in 1550, this is how, this is not an upside down map, this is how the cartographers drew the map in 1550. The habit had not yet taken shape. And why not put Africa in this direction with South Africa at the top? Um, now, our map of Africa was drawn up at the Berlin Conference in between 1884 and 1885. So those of you who don't know history, this is when the Europeans, uh, the German, French, Italian, even the Americans were present, the Belgians, decided to take the map of Africa and draw the borders. So there you see the map of Africa prior to the division, and there you see the map of Africa after the division. Africa was cut up by Europeans. So our images of Africa are predetermined by who's drawing the map. Those borders, they're not objective, they're subjective. And it's that subjectivity that I want to speak about today. Um, and to quote uh, an, an ancient philosopher, Pliny the Elder, who said, um, I'm not gonna try to get, I'd be embarrassed to speak Latin here, but um, I mean, you all understand the, basically saying there's always something new out of Africa. And when Pliny the Elder wrote his book about Africa, he actually spoke about white Africans. So the fact that I'm a white African was already known in the ancient times. This is not something new. This is not as a result of colonialism. There was always dialogue. There was always exchange. Africa was always influencing Europe and being influenced by Europe. The, trades, the trade winds and the trade sails were crossing the Mediterranean. Remember, Africa is just on the other side of the Mediterranean. It's not very far away. Um, so, always something new out of Africa. <laughs> So perhaps I should begin, I mean, I don't know if I should just carry on speaking. I mean, you should maybe yeah. interrupt me if you have any questions. No, carry on, because um, do you know anything about your ancestors? When did they land it in Africa? Or they will actually um, grow up um, f f from directly from the land of Africa? Yeah, I mean, my ancestors, that's the thing. Is, I mean, I might be white, but I have an ancestry which has been in Africa for 300 years. I can date back my ancestors all the way back to um, not the first wave, but, but certainly very, very, um, very early. You know, I mean, after 300 years, at what point do you become African? And of course, I mean, I don't want to go today into speaking too much about the legacy of apartheid, although we have to speak about that because it implicates the work on exhibition upstairs. But how does one become what one becomes? And one of the things I did actually, interestingly enough, it was in Italy, it was during the 1993 Venice Biennale that I decided to change my date of birth to May 1968 and give birth to myself. And we'll speak about that a bit later. But one of the things I tried to do as a young artist is create an institutional critique. How do you critique the institution? And the institution exists not just in terms of the bricks and the, and the white cube and the, 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 the way the institution functions in terms of how it presents exhibitions, but the institution of art is also the CV. And I decided to claim the CV space for myself as a way to try to literally give birth to myself, to try to understand. Now, the question that I pose is, if you're born into a crime against humanity, 
as a white South African, how do you become a racist? And what might you do in order to avoid being a racist? And what are the, 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 the dominoes, that are the political dominoes that get set in motion that turn you into what you become? And so one of the things I did was to try to understand history. I started to collect a series of dates. And my CV, my curriculum vitae, always began on the 6th of April, 1652, because that was the date when a man called Jan van Riebeek, a Dutch man, went to South Africa and declared South Africa, at that time, the Cape, a colony of the Dutch, a colony of Holland. And following that date, um, I collected all dates from history which had a subjective relation to me. Subjective in the sense that they somehow in, implicated me, involved me, influenced me. Um, dates which, things that happened that resulted in me. So if I had to make a formula of myself. Yeah. But why May 68? Um, because the history of South Africa somehow um, might be marked by other days. For example, the beginning of the apartheid, which is um, 1948. 48, yeah. right? Um, and then also the, the the struggle of some important days of the ANC, of you know Mandela, and so on. Why did you choose 68, which is also quite a contradictory date? Because May 68 in France means some kind of you know. Uh, idealist revolution, but 68 is also based on the total misunderstanding of the cultural revolution in China, which uh, was a disaster rather than a revolution um, for us. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean to you, 68? In fact, I like your question very much because your question, your question is also the answer. It's the idea of disaster. Yeah. It's this idea of failure. Because as a white African, I am, by definition, a cultural failure. So I will answer the question, but I need to add one step in between, which actually explains the question quite well. So very recently, I decided to change my CV. Well, actually, each time I publish the CV, I update it and I change it. I add and subtract dates depending on my subjectivity. And I decided that my cultural history doesn't begin on the 6th of April, 1652. Instead, it becomes... Uh, the other direction. The other direction. Uh, I think I've, I'm missing an image. Yeah, I'm missing an image. Okay. So it actually begins... No, it's not this one. So there's, there's an image that's missing. So actually, was very important, I can't show you the image, but you don't need the image anyway. So five years earlier to 1652, five years before Jan van Riebeek arrived, something important happened. So the Dutch had been considering to start a colony. Um, so had the, 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 the French, so were in fact the, the Swedish, the Danish, a number of European countries were considering to start a colony in Cape Town as a fueling station between Europe and the, and the, the Indonesia and Malaysia and the, 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 the East Indies. And what happened was a boat was shipwrecked in Cape Town called the New Harlem. Yeah. And what happened is that the New Harlem was shipwrecked and the survivors basically had to wait to be saved. Mm. Now, back in the, in, the, in the 17th century, that could take the better part of six months in order to be saved, which means that they had to set up home. Mm. They, they planted vegetables, they planted crops, they befriended the local people, and they created lives. Yeah. And when they went back to Holland, they then created something called the Remonstranti, which was a document in which they said that the indigenous people of South Africa were not cannibals, they were not violent, they weren't going to attack them, and they said it would be good to create a colony. So I decided to change the history of South Africa in the sense of instead of starting with the flag which gets rather start with the idea of failure, the idea of something which is broken. Start with the idea of the shipwreck, the failed revolution, the failure of utopia, the failure of something, the, the, the grand narratives of politics. Um, and then, and in many ways, the, my, my, my series of dates, if you actually look at them, they're about failures. 
They're by things that go wrong because we're defined as much by things that go right as much as we're defined by things that go wrong. And I chose May 68 because I was deeply influenced by the, the ideas of the Situationist International and this idea of particularly Guy Debord and his idea of um, plagiarism coming from Lotre Mont. Yeah. which is also coming from Lothar Mont, who was born in South America. So I was, I was looking at the idea of how one invents oneself. Mm -hmm. If you're going to invent yourself, if you're going to give birth to yourself, what better um, place to mark time with than a failed revolution? A revolution built on this idea of utopia, which is absolutely impossible to achieve, which will always be bought out by the, the, the mechanisms of power. Yeah. So, how do you decide to be an artist? <laughs> I mean, there's so many things to do, and you also have an <laughs> interesting knowledge of the history and also a very interesting interpretation. Why you didn't go down to the way um, to be um, a activist, political activist, or a academic intellectual? Um, I like it because you're surprising now with questions that we're not planned for and so I'm going to have to, I can't show you any, any images, you're just going to have to trust me. So it's a fantastic um, question. Why did I decide to become an artist? Because, well, it's very simply put, um, and the, the, actually maybe the next image, I mean, what happens when you're born in a country and every person you trust, your church, the police, your parents, your school teachers, every moral authority above you tells you that this crime against humanity is literally coming from God. God chose the Afrikaans race after the, the, the Israelites as his chosen race. Um, and there's a whole lot of historical reasons why Afrikaans people thought that. But what happens if from one day to another you wake up and you realize it's all a lie? Your church was wrong. They lied to you. What happens if you discover your father lied to you and every single thing that you believe in is wrong? So you know, this goes back to this idea of failure and this idea of the failed revolution. So when I was 15, I ended up running away from home and, was pretty, and became a punk. After you hosed, holding the crocodile. Yes, I was holding the crocodile when I was 10 years old. That was a kind of, um, I mean, we can speak about that image at length because of the resonance with the image from, um, from Hector Peterson. But yeah, so, I ran away from home when I was 15 and became a punk living on the streets. And, but the, the, the thing about South Africa is that, um, I think maybe I have an image here. I mean, um, no, not there, no, okay. So the only, the, the, the backbone and the structure of apartheid was conscription. Every white man from the age of 16 was conscripted into the military. You had to go to the army. And if you went to the army, you were shooting people in Soweto or in Angola. It was a real war. It wasn't a, a, a soft intensity conflict. It was a, a proper war where, where, where you'd be used to kill people. And because of my conscience, and my understanding of the structures of power, I decided that I would never go to the army. I was part of a group of people who, a group of men who said, no matter what you do, you will never go to the army. I mean, you will, you will, we will never go to the army. And the consequence was six years in jail. I was on trial for treason. And the only way to not go to the army would be to study. All right? So what happened was, I, at that time, I was putting myself through school and I was really focusing on the mathematical sciences. I really imagined I would want to become a quantum physicist or something really intelligent and fancy coming from a very working class family because in the working class you imagine the only way you would save yourself is as an engineer or a quantum physicist. You'd not, you could not imagine anything um, so ridiculous as studying art. Um, and I went to the university to, to put my application and in the university application, you were forced to put two choices. If you didn't put a second choice, your first choice was null and void, or you would be disqualified. I've, and at that time, I was extremely militant in my understanding of structures of power, and I was against every form of hierarchy, and every form of power, and I would directly challenge every power. So the fact that I was being forced to put a second choice for me was an abuse of power. And so what I did was I decided, you know what, I'm going to say fuck you to the system. And I went looking through the list of everything you could study at the university. And I went through the list and I looked for the most ridiculous, pathetic, stupid, 
obscene, nothing, what could you study? Fine arts. Like, I put that as my second choice. Okay. Chance happened that I was accepted to both. Okay, now we can, that's a, you know, a later, and a later discussion would go into how did that happen? Was it chance or was it a calling? But I was accepted to art. Art and science, right. So what, for the first time in my life, I said, what is art? So I went off to the school class where it was the end of the year, um, where the teacher was, was teaching art to try to discover. Right? I'm curi I'm just curiosity. And she had decided to take a departure from the official curriculum. Now, apartheid was absolutely fascistic. So for instance, um, the birth of Venus and Michelangelo's David were forbidden in the school curriculum on account of the nudity. Michelangelo had a penis and therefore you were not allowed to show it in any art history textbook. It was that strict. And she had decided at the end of the year to step outside of the curriculum and teach something from her heart. And she was on that day teaching Dada, which is not, would not be taught normally. And I sat in the class, and there was only, I mean, it was, I, I remember that day very vividly because there were only two students sitting at the front of the class. The rest were at the back of the class smoking and laughing and joking and having fun, yeah. out of control. And I remember this teacher, this, this day very vividly. She wasn't exactly correct, but she wasn't exactly wrong. And she said that during the First World War, there were these artists who retreated to the neutral country of Switzerland. And these artists had said, if they, that they are going to, if mustard gas, trench warfare, barbed wire, and all the atrocities of the First World War were the result of the logical, rational brain, they would do the illogical, irrational contrary. And I remember sitting there, and if I was a cartoon, a light bulb would have flashed above my head. It was like, wow, if art can be that, I want to do that. And on that day, I decided, okay, I'm going to study art. So I went in, I studied art, I did my four years, I have a, I have a degree in art. Um, here you see me at the end of my degree, uh, no, this is actually my second year, it's 1986. There you see me with hair being arrested uh, on the university campus. And you'll notice, very importantly, all the policemen are wearing short sleeves because it was an incredibly hot day, as it, as it tends to be. And we were all wearing sweaters, and I even have a sweater around my waistband. The reason being that we knew we were going to jail that night. We, know, we knew that we were going to be spending some time in prison, so we were dressing for the occasion. And uh, you'll see at the bottom the photograph is by Kevin Carter, who's the same person who took this very famous photograph, uh, eventually committing suicide. And then, he killed himself, right? and then he killed himself. And I got my six year prison sentence for treason. I went to London as a refugee. And I was explaining last night to some, some friends here, it was very important also to know, as we all have discussions today about refugees in Europe, refugees also have blonde hair and blue eyes. It's just the nature of circumstance that puts you into a political situation where you might have to flee your country. I had to flee my country. I went to London as a refugee, and then I ended up leaving London, and I went to New York where I, I made this particular painting, um, where I was the assistant of Richard Prince, which uh, sold for a lot more money than I ever earned. Um, and then when Mandela was released, I could return to South Africa. And when I got back to South Africa, the first thing I did, actually in the home of Gandhi, um, is I took the blood out of my arm. It was very symbolic, because friends of mine were living in Gandhi's house. I took the blood out of my arm and I washed myself with my own blood. This is the blood of my ancestors. Because no matter what I did, I will always be connected to my ancestors. I will always be the white South African. And it comes with Pink Floyd. <laughs> Pink Floyd. I, I like this image. I, this is actually an image I'm going to be using for. I have an exhibition in China in September. Um, and um, I'm very influenced by literature and poetry. And actually, Roger Waters was, was making his lyrics based on a He's Chinese poet. He's soon. Right? Roger Waters is going to sing in Rome, I think. 
there's a concert soon. I saw some posters. But he was very influenced by Chinese poetry, ancient Chinese poetry. And so yeah. um, this is a, my show is going to be called A Thousand, Years of, uh, a Thousand Miles of Moonlight, yeah. which is a quote from Roger Waters that is actually quoting a Chinese poem. And I'm using this image here of the razor mesh um, because that was actually a material invented in South Africa. So it's part of my cultural heritage. It's part of the contradiction of my culture, you know, because when I came back to South Africa and I washed myself in my own blood, I was actually giving birth to myself because every single thing that I had been taught to believe in was a crime against humanity. So I had to reinvent myself. I literally had to start again. How do you learn to read and write? What morals, what values, what ethics, what do you hold true? And what do you believe in? So I had to start again and it was as in the process of becoming an artist that I was able to reinvent myself in order to fully run away from home, um, in order to fully recreate um, a new, to, 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 to move from the person I was born into the person that gave birth to themselves. Now this is an interesting question because, you know, how many of you, you know, when, for instance, I remember the first time I met um, Genesis Porridge, P. Orridge, and he asked the same question of me that Brian Geisen asked of him, which is, what is your name? And I said, Kendall. And he said, no, what is your real name? You know, we carry the names given to us by our parents, which means we carry their heritage, their values, their history. How might you give birth to yourself? What might you call yourself if you were able to give birth to yourself? And now you are living in Europe. <laughs> you are living in Europe. Um, do you think this is a new context to you, or you are already very familiar with that? Well, the thing is, you know, when I said in the beginning that Africa was just on the other side of the Mediterranean, Africa was, has never been divorced from Europe. It was never separated from Europe. There was always a flow or, and dialogue. Um, you know, when I went to art school, I did a classical education where I was taught European art history. So we went from the pyramids through to the contemporary. Um, actually, a person I studied with is now the wife of Jeff Koons. Um, there is dialogue and exchange. Africa is part of the world. But what African, what European people might not study is African art. So that's, you know, it's not a two-way dialogue, it's a one-way street. Um, and living in Europe, I'm always reminded very carefully that I'm not European. I am African. I'm too African to be European, but then back in Africa, I'm too European to be an African. So I find myself at a very interesting interzone. I find myself at a border, that same refugee border between Europe and Africa. I find myself caught there where I'm able to be both and yet neither, which is actually a very, very empowering and inspiring position to be because you see both sides. Yeah, and um, that makes you um, use a lot of images of uh, so-called African images, including, of course, the mask. But the interesting thing is your first mask is not the typical African uh, sculpture mask, mm -hmm. but it was a mask of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing is that at the end of apartheid, so during apartheid, um, I didn't answer an earlier question, which was, um, you asked why did I become an artist and an activist? So the, I became an artist through this strange journey, this calling through Dada. And you know, the, the, you know da, artists like Picabia still remain very, very close to my heart. I think Picabia is the most underrated artist, and I think Duchamp is the most overrated artist of, of that group. Um, but um, so during apartheid, I was out making posters and propaganda. Because during apartheid, the, the, the calling was that you should lend your talents to the struggle. So during apartheid, the art was, the culture was a weapon of the struggle. Culture was a weapon of the revolution. Said that we need to now return to the idea of art for art's sake, the idea of beauty, the idea of poetry. We need to stop the idea of art being a weapon of the struggle. And we need to just make beautiful things. But for me, I couldn't. So I wrote an essay in, in, in challenge to L.B. Sachs, and it's kind of the essay that more or less made me very famous, in which I said, no, we, you know, we can't make art 
um, for art's sake today. And instead of culture being a weapon of the struggle, no, the struggle must become a weapon of culture. Let's take our experiences, let's take the things that we lived and use them in art. Um, now, I grew up in a crime against humanity, and at that time I was, very, I was thinking a lot about the Adorno quote, you can't no poetry after Auschwitz. Um, how could you, in the wake of the Holocaust, make things beautiful? And the same for apartheid. I mean, at the end of apartheid, how could you make aesthetic objects? So my idea was then, and here's the, an image of the work upstairs, which is wonderfully installed on this beautiful yellow wall. How might I take the experiences of living in a police state? How might I take the experiences of being beaten by the police daily in protest and transform and translate that into a form of resistance? How might I take real experiences and use it as a way of challenging aesthetics? So, I mean, at the time, I mean, I, I, it was, this is the, this was really the generation, my generation was the rise of relational aesthetics, which I always had a, you know, an uncomfortable relation with because for me it wasn't about relational aesthetics, but maybe relational ethics. And how might experience be used to challenge perception. So let's go all the way back to the image of Africa. Why the map is the way it is, it's just a habit. And why do we think of things as being beautiful? It's just another habit. And as, ha as habits change, as social realities change, so our images of realities change. So our idea of beauty changes and shifts. So what I tried to do was, you know, in this process of giving birth to myself, um, this idea of um, detournement of Guy Debord and the situations. How you take a sign and turn it into its opposite. So there you have the very famous image of the policeman from uh, May 1968. And then I, I, I add my, my kind of um, word made flesh. So there's a word in there um, which you can't really read and um, we can speak about those words later. Or, you know, and then I have, here's another version of the, the police patterns, like the ones upstairs. So. The, these ideas of structures of power. How do we become what we become? You take two police batons and you put them together and you have the sign of the cross. So this is about how church and state work together. How symbols of power come into being. How we construct our images of law and order based on very simple um, ideas of, um, you know, the pentagram or the other way around. So this one, this is a police light that's normally on the top of a car. And it's called the devil you know, um, because uh, in alchemy, um, this way around, it's a symbol, it's a symbol like the, on the one euro coin in Italy, the Vitruvian man, where you have the head, the two arms and the legs from Leonardo. And upside down, it's the symbol of the devil. It's a symbol of chaos. Um, and how might we be able to construct reinvent these ancient symbols in order to question structures of power and things that you might take for granted. Um, so we come back to. And in this, um, do you think religion is also a structure of power that has its own violence? Well, of course, I mean, you know, when I take two police batons together and I make a crucifix, I mean, of course, we know the history of the Crusades and the history of violence which is um, perpetuated um, in the name of something that claims to be better than other things. You know, um, I always find it fascinating when people speak to me about my work as being violent. Um, one of the accusations is I'm aestheticizing violence. Um, well, what should I do with violence? Should I, um, you know, if not, like in alchemy, you're shifting the, the lead into gold, is there another function of violence than aestheticizing or challenging it? You know, flipping the mirror, mirror around. But whenever people say to me that my work is violent, I say, but wait a minute, one of the most erotic, charged, violent and political images that you could make is the crucifix. You know, you have a man naked, nailed to a, to a cross, being beaten. I mean, it's an incredibly violent and charged image. Um, and so one of the things that the artist should be able to do is reveal these, 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 these aesthetics for what they are, the politics that is implicit in these kinds of images. Yeah, and also in your work there's some um, quite an obvious references to weapons, uh, forms of um, 
you know, instruments of violence such as um, barbed wire, such as um, 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 uh, all kind of torture and so on. Um, don't you think this is a bit too straightforward? Being, being an artist, I mean, what, what's the, what's the, the delicate borderline between kind of aesthetic and ethical um, position, being an artist and and being a, a propagandist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think my work ever falls into propaganda because it doesn't have a clear message. My work is always contradictory. So they can't be propaganda unless the, the message is, is, is binary or dualistic. Um, and, you know, for instance, I speak about my work in terms of politics. I've never made work which is political in, in, in the sense of me announcing who I voted for. I think that, you know, the kinds of artists who call themselves political by announcing this is, the, this politics is good and this politics is evil um, are no better than the missionaries who went through Africa. Um, and I, I have huge problems with that kind of announcement because it's arrogant, um, it's assuming that the artist is placing themselves above anybody else rather than inside a community. Um, for me, politics is more interesting in that the moral ambiguity, the contradiction of the work, places you in a position where you have to decide what do you think. You know, for instance, this work over here is called Manifest. Um, it says, what do you believe in? And, on the, you know, and it's, it's obvious reference to, it's, it's based on the exact same spiral as the Bruce Nauman from 1967, the true artist helps the world by revealing mystic truths. Um, but in offering the viewer the choice, what do you believe in? What is your position in relation to the moral ambiguity that I'm introducing you to? It's a form of generosity, it's an invitation. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not um, a dictate. Um, and in the process of you answering the question, you learn more about yourself rather than about me. Because my role of the artist is just to be able to present the mirror to you as an invitation. It's not me to create converts. It's not me to create followers. It's not for me to, to try to, um, you know, in my manifesto that I wrote a couple of years ago, I said, art changes the world one perception at a time. That's the weapon of art, is that we change perception. But you can only change perception by, through unexpected means. You can only change perception by pulling the carpet out from expectations. It reminds me that you know, in, um, in the politics, um, in the totalitarian or dictatorship system, um, what I actually for the people in power, the most dangerous thing is not the opposition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not the people who say no to them, mm -hmm. but perhaps other people who say I'm indifferent, mm -hmm. meaning you have a group of people, a, a community or a kind of a part of the society which is not playing the same game as this political confrontation. Uh, hence, you have you know anarchists, you have artists, you have people who produce a kind of uh, ambiguous vision of things that they don't know how to deal with. Um, do you think the art system today becomes increasingly uh, trapped by this logic of communication mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we are pushed to explain everything to everybody um, trying to make art transparent mm -hmm. um, and being working in the institution a part of the possible discussion about you know what is still possible to be uh, uh, critical about institution is how to preserve the dark zone of the institution. I think that, indeed, if I have to sum up the way I believe the art system works today, I mean, it's not working any different than, than, than any other luxury brand. You know, it's about branding. It's about an artist creating their brand. And one of the things I always resisted was this idea of branding. You know, my work is shifting between neons and, and paintings and sculptures and drawings. And I do that very consciously because I never wanted to become, I said in my manifesto, artists should be fire brands. 
not brands. You know, we should burn the trail. We should, we should constantly be one step ahead so we don't get assimilated into a system that would co-opt you into the world's biggest money laundering industry. Um, where artists, you know, the, the, the power of the artist is that you can be in the gutter with low lives prostitutes and homeless and rats and then you can on the next day be having dinner with a king or a queen you know the artist is a very particular social animal that can go up and down the full hierarchy and that gives you a freedom to speak it gives you freedom to see things it gives you freedom to exp you, you can be absolutely insane and crazy and antisocial and like the you know the court jester tell the truth Unfortunately, most artists have stopped to do the up and down. They want to stay at the top, at the at the golden table. Um, you know, so you know, here, this is the one of the works I made in Rome um, in nine, I think it was in '99 or '98, a very long time ago, which is the the word believe, and the three middle letters of the word believe is the word lie. You know, this how do you know what you believe? The contradiction of language, the inability to express truth. Is our weapon actually in Italian meaning drink? <laughs> Get drunk and then you lie, <laughs> or you tell the truth. <laughs> ah, yes, here we go. Here, here's the here's yeah, 25 of, of March 1647. So this was the the image I was looking for. It got a bit lost. Um, the idea of disaster. So shall we speak so about this? So we talk about drink. Speaking about drink. Um, so I've made many works of art that are about myself, my body. I've molded every part of my body, and I really mean every part of my body. Um, made sculptures, made bronzes, made champagne glasses, made all kinds of objects with my body, with my white skin, interrogating the idea of identity. But I've only ever made one work of art called self-portrait, and it's this. It's a broken bottle, a broken Heineken bottle. It's a piece of garbage. It's only this big. It literally is the most useless thing, I think, known to civilization because you can't use it for anything. You can maybe use it to stab somebody, but apart from that, it's useless. I find that interesting because, you know, one of the things I did is I decided not to call things lost, uh, found objects because this is, the, the, for me, the arrogance of Duchamp. The found object presupposes that the artist comes along like God and says, this is a work of art. And the artist puts their ego and their stamp on it, and now it's a work of art, thanks to the artist's ego. Now, the fact that the water might come from a drought-stricken area, or the fact that uh, you know, there might be a drought in California, but Coca-Cola is using all the water to, 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 make, to, to sell bottled water, doesn't go, because the artist decided from now on it's a work of art. Okay, now what happens if you flip that around, and instead of calling it a found object, you call it a lost object? Because by saying lost objects, I'm participating in the history of the objects. I'm saying this object, everything that happened before is implicated. And I'm just participating in the manufacturing of meaning. And I'm not creating the first nor the last meaning. I'm just adding my layer to what's already there. So the object, in, in this case, is a bottle of beer designed in, in, in Amsterdam and exported globally around the world. Um, and as you can see, you know, it's coming from South Africa. The word imported is bigger than the word Heineken. Um, and that's because in South Africa, like in most colonial countries, there's a huge insecurity complex. So you're thinking that anything that's coming from Europe is obviously better than anything that you are. So of course they're gonna sell the beer as imported. It doesn't matter that it tastes like shit. No, uh, I mean, you know, it's very often I travel somewhere and people give you a bottle of Heineken beer and it's like, why are you doing that? I hate it. Because they assume that I like Heineken. No, there's a lot of self-loathing in being a white South African. Why would you assume I love myself as a white South African? No, I hate myself. I want to cut my skin off. So the broken bottle of beer is the perfect metaphor for my identity. So this object was designed, it carried the beer, Importantly, it's spirit. Beer is a spirit. And once the beer was drunk, now the object has no more meaning. 
the object has no value. If it's still whole, maybe you could use it to carry water. Maybe you could sell something. But once you break the bottle, it's absolutely garbage. And at this time, when I made this work in 1995, I was very interested. I, hadn't, I didn't have a penny to my name. I was absolutely uh, destitute. Um, and I was interested in this idea of recycling. How might I use my life as a way to generate works of art? How might I be able to recycle things in a very ecological way? But, you know, I was influenced by, for instance, you know, it fascinates me that um, nobody has ever, at least to my knowledge, written an article comparing my broken Heineken beer bottle with the kids in the townships in Soweto who take a can of Heineken, cut it up and make a toy car. But that's exactly what it is. It's tourist art. So, you know, the kids are, are recycling garbage in order to, except I'm recycling the garbage in order to weaponize the imagination. So do you think that the political struggle today is shifting to the, in addition, or in addition to the uh, continuation of social political struggle, um, it's somehow, uh, shifting or focusing more on ecological struggle? No. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of lip service. There's a lot of artists who are, there's a lot, I mean, the, the whole industry, you know, you just need to walk through the historical center of Rome and you see, I mean, every fashion brand is now ecological. You know, it's, it's very easy to say we are ecological in order to sell things. There's no commitment. Um, and you see it also in art. I mean, it's, you know, ecological just becomes a new way to, to you know, political art today is, is, um, is everywhere. But it's very problematic and complicated if you're making so-called political art that is immediately being assimilated back into the institution and just becomes another brand. Because branding is the contrary of politics. So real politics asks questions about power. Um, whereas fake politics pays lip service to power because the whole thing about power is it will never allow itself to be critiqued. The second you critique power, it will turn you into a fashion in order to, in order to diffuse the challenge and assimilate you. So, where is the um, ideal site, a location for art for you? If I'm not against the art institution, you know, it's, I'm, 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 I'm very fond of the art museum, I'm very fond of the art gallery system, I'm fond of the art gallery system for one very important reason. I don't have the talent to sing, and I don't have the talent with a football, so I can't fill a stadium of 50,000 people and influence those people with my craft. I can gather maybe you know 20 people here, and I don't know maybe 20 people online. Um, I can I can invite people to a museum or a gallery to engage with my work, um, and it's a very small audience, but it's the most powerful audience. And you know, believing that art changes the world by changing perception, if the, the you know let's face it, the the, the top one percent of society the top, the richest of the rich, these are the people coming to look at art. These are the people coming to museums and galleries. These are the people whose choices and decisions affect the lives of millions. So for the one person who's standing in the art, imagine if Trump had been exposed to art at an earlier age, at an earlier time. He might not have the attitude or the ideas that he has. And I, I mean, perhaps I'm naive, perhaps I'm utopian, but I do believe that the challenge of art is in that level of consciousness, that it is able to change the way you understand the world. So this is very Duchampier. <laughs> Duchamp is the, the, the man I love to hate and hate to love. Um, you know, so in this process of needing to reinvent myself, give birth to myself, so one of the, the, the hierarchies that exist is history. So you have formal history which says Jan van Riebeek came to South Africa on the 6th of April, 1652. They don't tell you about the shipwreck. The same form of um, hierarchy exists in art history where we taught things about Duchamp. So we're told that Marcel Duchamp um, exhibited the urinal called Fountain in 1917 at the Armory Exhibition. 
What they don't tell you is it took him another 30 years before anybody knew that he made it. They don't tell you that it, that it wasn't an instant success, that it took a lot of time, and he had to create the idea of the ready-made before it was adopted into art history and then written backwards. And one of the things I try to do, you, you've seen me quoting um, Bruce Nauman, here you see me quoting Marcel Duchamp, is how can I take an aesthetic that exists mm -hmm. and offset it very slightly with the most minimum means in order to try to challenge your reading of that history, in order to challenge your reading of what the object might have been before it was Marcel Duchamp's bottle rack. You know, it may have been used to dry Heineken bottles or other kinds of bottles, and now, like this, it becomes, the work is called rack, which is another way to say a torture rack, but also, you know, it has also sexual connotations, the idea of the rack, the, the idea for me that history is torture, art history is torture, the idea of the, the, the illegitimacy of, because we're living in a global age today, and you weren't born in Europe, nor was I, we're coming from other continents, and yet we're forced to follow the European model. Why? Why do we, I mean, let's face it, um, Jeff Koons is a folk artist from a very small island in the Americas. He's, folk, he's, he's, he's making folk art for a little island of white cube galleries in New York. Why do we assume that that little island is more important than any other place? Why do we assume that that is dominant cultural, aesthetical theory that we all have to fall in line behind? What makes the, 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 the person living in another island in, in, in Africa or in China, what makes their aesthetic illegitimate and less valid, less important, less valuable. So one of the things I try to do is how do you challenge the dominance of what we assume to be art history? How do we challenge the dominance of what we assume to be official art history and shift it, it, it more almost like a punk underground process? Let's see, I want to... Uh, I. So, um, Bruce Nauman. Apparently, it's having a huge influence on on the aesthetics that you have developed, such as the neo signs and the shifting of letters, the the, the game of words, and so on. Um, don't you think he's also another folk artist from an island? Absolutely. I mean, I, I do respect Bruce Nauman. Um, I think he made some marvelous works. Um, I don't think he's as great as we are making him out to be. Um, I'm much more interested in Lotre um, who was playing with words. Um, I'm, I'm much more interested in the, the history of poetry and language. Or, you know, more than, than, than Bruce Nauman, I'm influenced by um, William Burroughs. Mm -hmm. And William Burroughs' concept of language as being a virus. Um, which is a much more metaphysical idea of how language might work. So we saw earlier, believe, which has the words lie in the middle. So this is a, a, an installation. You don't see the third wall, but it's, a, it's, like a, it's like a third wall of prison, and you walk inside, and there are three neons. One says border, and the B is broken, so it becomes order. One says terror, and it becomes error. And the other one says danger, and it becomes anger. Um, it's a very charged statement about politics, but also about language. Because the limits of your world is the limits of your language. You know, the, the biggest struggle that Bruce Nauman never had, but the biggest struggle coming from Africa as a, as a minority in Africa is, and I think every African as, uh, in, in, in accordance as well with, you see African Americans in, in the United States or the feminist movement or any person looking for, the, for re representing their rights, the biggest challenge is finding a voice to speak. How might you self-represent? How might you be able to speak for yourself, define yourself, rather than be spoken for? Because there's a lot of, you know, we go back to the map of Africa and the way it is. I mean, people will insist it is that way around because it is that way around. And what happens is that a lot of things we take for granted as common sense are actually politically inscribed hierarchies that predetermine what you're allowed to say and not allowed to say. Um, and so my interest in language is how it predetermines your liberty. And it, it prevents you from being able to 
speak openly. That goes back to the structure of power, that you cannot speak if you don't have a tongue. Great. So, I mean, one of the things that was very important for me as a young artist is I was very influenced by the Arte Povera movement. I want to, do, I want to speak, that, speak about that for a second. Yes. Well, um, number one, um, Beretti is really um, Arte Povera artist for you? I see him as an Arte Povera. Am I wrong? No, I'm, I'm just uh, curious because I... Are the borrow this one over there too? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I choose Barry. It's, it's such a, it's such a dive, Actually, it's such a, a brand name that covers so many different things. And there are artists who are doing really typical arte povera kind of work are not included in the official list. Yeah. And the others uh, are doing suspiciously uh, too conceptual, mm -hmm. but not the material work, such as Boetti, mm -hmm. um, is branded as the main artist of Arte Povera. So what's the logic, and how do you look at this? I, I struggled. So this morning when I was trying to choose an image to speak about Arte Povera, I really struggled. And I was struggling, should I show Cornelis? And I was looking at the, the sex with the coal. I was looking at Mario Maritz. But in the end, I chose this image. I chose this image because it's called Showman Shaman. And I quite like the contradiction in Showman Shaman because he was already talking about that kind of, um, in a way, role of the artist, but also being very ironic. Um, and I chose it because it is a way for me to speak about Arte Povera, but also introduce another theme, which is the, the importance of spirituality and the importance of a spiritual practice in, in work. Um, but no, I don't think that Boetti was any, for me, I mean, as I'm as influenced by Cornelis or, 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 or any of the other, you know, um, so Arte Povera artists. Uh, I, don't, I don't choose Boetti specifically, although there's a, there's a Boetti sign at the entrance to the museum, so I guess that also influenced me um, in choosing Boetti to illustrate the fact. But, but you know, the, the idea of Arte Povera working with um, an economy of means, working with, um, and I think that a lot of international discussion about the Arte Povera don't take into account the, the metaphysics of their practice. This was almost animistic, the way they related to materials and the relation between materials and politics. You know, animism we think of as an African um, something out there concept, but, but every material has a political resonance. And that political resonance is also at the same time something about what you believe in. You know, for me, the idea of objects, images, they all have a spiritual function as well as a symbolic function, as well as a material function. And these things can't be, they are interconnected and interwoven. Um, and so the idea of working with an economy of means, a broken bottle, a piece of garbage, can say so much about so many things, and yet there's nothing there. You know, like a, piece, a lump of coal. You know, and when, with, you know, a Cornelis lump of coal is more than just a fossil fuel. It, it, but it implicates all of the, the politics of fossil fuels and the history of how fossil fuels come into existence and, and what they might mean. Yeah. So, yesterday you mentioned there's a kind of similarity between so-called art of and African art. What's that? What's this relation to this relation to um, the world that you're living in? The world that how your lived experience, your social, political environment influences your choice of materials, aesthetics, and objects. That these things are interconnected. So I, I use this image from the, the Black Panther film because it's a um, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's actually an interesting cliche because. It asks this question about what is African art? What, what might African art be? Um, and in this particular scene in the film, um, the, the, the hero, the, the, the protagonist over there, ends up making the point that most of the objects the of African art that you see in Africa, I mean, they're, they're more trophies than objects, but what is African art? Now, African art was never made to be put into a vitrine. It was never made to be put into, um, you know, it's, I, I, I like to make the, the, the comparison. If you, 
imagine 150 years ago, a person, male or female, makes two masks in the middle of the jungle in the Congo. And these two masks are identical, made from the same piece of wood by the same person. You take the one mask and you fast forward it into the present and you put it behind glass in the British Museum. The other one is used, it's danced, it's brought, it's brought to life, it has to be brought to life, it has to be animated. It would be animated with blood, the blood of your enemy, the blood of, um, of um, you know, menstrual blood, sperm, milk, honey. It will be brought to life by some form of um, ritual, and then it gets danced, so it gets worn. And in the process of dancing, it gets scratched, it gets a patina, it gets sweat, it gets pieces of hair, it gets pieces of skin. Now, in the process of dancing, it's very important to note that should I be the dancer, the performer, if I am trying to invoke the god of war, for instance, in the mind, in the eyes of every single person participating in the ritual, you would not say that's Kendall wearing a mask. You would say, Kendall has gone, that is the god of war. And in my mind, I would not say, oh, I'm dancing, pretending to be the god of war. No, I become the god of war. It's an embodiment. Now, it is through the use that the object determines value. It is through being danced that the, that the mask becomes important, both for the people who make it and for the people who collect it. So fast forward into the present, and you have these two masks. You have the perfectly clean, pristine, perfect mask, untouched since it was made. It's useless. It's considered a curio. It's, it has no value, neither for the people who made it nor the people who collect it. It's only the mask which has the patina, the use, that is important. Now, in terms of then thinking about the relation between the things we make and the life we live, that becomes hugely important for me. Because African art, you know, it, it's, it's something that was, there was never museums in Africa because art was part of your daily life. Art was part of the part of, you know, I love this image. It's one of the very early images of the, of the narrow fetishes, the Nkisi figures. And you see, it was, it was part of the village. Art was danced, it was, it was performed, it was, it's, it's part of your daily symbolic sacred space. It's interesting you mentioned daily symbolic and sacred. Um, what are the relation between the three things? <laughs> Just according to the European uh, uh, structure of knowledge, mm -hmm. They are separated. They belong to different worlds. Only recently. Yeah. This is a this is the a 20th century capitalist yeah. idea yeah. of you know capitalism. Let's say if you imagine capitalism as the new religion, it is. Then the it daily is. sacred symbolic is the same thing. Yeah. And in a pre-capitalistic Europe, the daily symbolic sacred was also the same thing. Yeah. It hasn't changed. It's just we're assuming today that capitalism is not a religion. But it is a religion. Yes. So, um, in a way, what we call art, it's a, a kind of uh, that reincarnation of this belief in the value that um, the process of creation has to be frozen into a preservable object, right? Mm -hmm. Hence, they applied the, the same principle onto the African, so-called African art, or the object that, which is supposed to be a kind of object of passage, mm -hmm. an object of um, ritual, and daily use, both mixed. Mm -hmm. And what are you producing? as an artist? Are you do producing, again, a trying to re-emancipate uh, that object back to this life trajectory of uh, passage? I think the role of the artist is to make visible the invisible. And when that invisible is a, irrespective of the faith, it's making visible what we believe in, 
right? So I asked the question earlier, what do you believe in? And it's in answering that question that it gives rise to works of art. So I love, as a great metaphor, you think about London, right? You have St. Paul's Cathedral. And St. Paul's Cathedral was once a place that people went to en masse, thousands of people going to, to pray, to, to, to pay homage to the, what they believed in. And more recently, people stopped going to St. Paul's except as tourists. And if you stand there at St. Paul's and you cross the Thames River, you go straight across the Millennium Bridge, you arrive at the Tate Museum. Now, the Tate Museum is the new cathedral where people go by the thousands to pay homage to what they believe in. Because contemporary art has become the new religion. It's become the new religion because it's, about, it's connected to money and to power. As traditional in the Renaissance, art was connected to money and power. So the, the signifiers have shifted, but the process remains the, the same in terms of that symbolic process of making visible the invisible making, manifesting, giving image, giving form to what people believe. I think it's a perfect um, ending statement here, because otherwise we would go very far to compare the Vatican and the Maxi. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have some questions. We have another 10 minutes. Alcune domande? Do you have a question? Liam has a question. <laughs> so how? Uh, Kenda? Um, first, first thing before the question, we're so glad that you're here. And uh, anyway, uh, OK. Um, I'm trying my best to, to ask a question because I'm not so good. Uh, what do you think to be, and I mean, and uh, actually for me, you are always a European, you know. Even uh, someone said, or even you tell me that you are African, I will never can have that concept that you are African. I don't know why, maybe we are Chinese. So, <laughs> So, is it matter you? Is it matter? Because we Chinese, anyway, I'm Malaysian. They always say that I'm Chinese in Malaysia. You know, mm -hmm. I born in Malaysia because I maybe I have some same 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 problem like you because I'm a Chi My parents are Chinese, and I born in Malaysia. So for the Malay, I'm always Chinese, and wherever I go, wherever I go, I always have a, a feeling that I'm always the second. Because no matter you go, you're always the second citizens in now all over the world. So, do you? What do you feel? What do you feel as a, a, a African? Uh, maybe for me, it's African European because maybe your 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 parents is from you know from somewhere. Is it? I mean, is it really necessary to answer this question? I mean, am I African? Am I European? I mean, it's very often these questions are imposed on you from the outside. I don't, need to t I don't need to know what I am, because I know what I am, even if I can't give a name to it. I mean, do I feel African? Yes. Do I feel European? Yes. Um, I feel both. Um, I took a lot of inspiration from Africa because, you know, so this, this image here um, was the, 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 the next image was, um, oh, it stopped working. They stopped working there. Um, so the idea was, is it? Yeah. Oh, it's not working. The idea was, you know, to, to go from those African objects in the vitrine and then to take Carl Andre's brick and toss it into the vitrine, smash the vitrine. And in that way, you know, this goes back to the work that I showed at the Apple, to throw Carl Andre's brick through the window of the museum. So reality then comes into the art gallery. So the brick can be used. It can be used as a minimalist object and have aesthetic value. You can throw it through the window, it becomes a weapon, but then it, it retains the value of the, 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 the minimalist object. It can be two things at the same time. It can be contradictory. Um, you know, the, I was, 
you know, the, 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 the brick thrown through the window was very much inspired by what was happening in May 68, that you had beauty in the street, where your lived experience charges you, um, gives you a charge that you can drag into the art gallery. Um, I can't name myself because I don't have the tools, I don't have the voice with which to give a proper definition of the self. But is it important? Um, unfortunately, today, you do get categorized. You're Chinese or Malaysian, or European or Italian. What I mean is that because this, I'm talking about this show, these exhibitions uh, was, uh, uh, of course, your work, I know your work is very, you know, neutral. You, it's not a problem of races. Only thing is because of this show that they, you, know, you are going get into the category, uh, category of uh, African show. I mean, this is the, this is what the question for, not about your work. Your work is very neutral. I, 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 I yes, mentioned. but that's the, the, you know the indeed the questions of identity, the questions of how we make what we make, and then how we get branded from the outside. I mean, yes, I'm on an African show here. Um, when I was showing with you in in, in uh, Ville Medici, it was a European show. Um, you know, I'm equally at home in both Europe and Africa, and it's not important for me to define myself, except my roots are, um, I always explain it like this. As an African, I have an animistic practice. And as an African, I have to seek out my ancestors. My ancestors are European. So what am I? I'm an African with European ancestors. That's the best way I can explain it. <laughs> question because I'd like the, um, the photo you you present before where the, it's written the beauty in the, is in the street because on the photo there is an actual beauty for me there is a wonderful uh, Citroen on the on the photograph even now only to say that um, would you then uh, believe to that because we are slowly moving into a very uh, important my way out uh, question of micro identity we're living in a country where it's actually a very important topic for politics I'm coming from a country where we almost uh, go through that very important topic that I hate personally would you would you think that there is maybe an option to reaffirm that we have a common vocabulary meaning like in a renaissance to pretend that maybe there is a community of let's say artists let's say that on that way i would like to believe that but i think it's very complicated because our nationalisms and our identities are completely swallowed up by by consumerism today you're not defined anymore by your politics you're defined by what you buy um, and unfortunately living in an age where the corporations are more powerful than the governments and it is the corporations who are predetermining our choices. I mean, Facebook has a bigger community and is more powerful than any government on the planet. And on Facebook, what is the value of identity? I mean, where do you find your individuality? Where do you find your identity? Um, and I would like to believe that we're living in an age when artists might understand the power of the image again. And artists might work together in challenging those hierarchies, those structures. But in order to do that, they're going to have to shake down the gallery system, which very few artists are prepared to do. You know, it's a bit like biting the, what, what do you call it, biting the hand that feeds, which is the, la the title of my last ex commercial gallery exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, the commercial gallery exhibition. Commercial gallery, biting the hand that feeds. <laughs> <laughs> last question? Okay, so we have an economy of seven minutes. Thank you very much. And um, there's only the passage. We will see the next step, what Kendall Gills is going to do, and which year is going to be born again. <laughs> grazie, grazie mille. Thank you very much.